So there are a couple of things that you might have noticed um, about this turtle that I will <coughs> fill you in on if you're not aware <coughs> about sea turtles and stuff. Um, first thing is, is that this, her name's Cassie. Uh, she was brought to us in the Maldives um, when she was injured. She's an olive ridley sea turtle in the eastern Pacific there deep sea divers and what they look out for out there is for jellyfish so their importance in the ecosystem is jellyfish controllers. Um, Olive Ridley turtles as well as the Kemp's Ridley turtles are what are known as Arribara nesters and these are when you get thousands upon thousands of turtles in a certain night coming out onto the beach and laying their eggs at one shot and the eggs also hatch at one shot as well so you get millions of hatchlings coming out onto the beach. Cassie was brought to us as a consequence of marine debris. Uh, her arm was caught in one of those discarded cement bags. So the fibers on the cement bags entangled on her fin and we had to amputate it. So we had to rehabilitate her during the time that she was with us. Over the course of about a couple of weeks, we wanted to make sure that she was able to dive down with just one flipper. And it took about two weeks before she was able to retrieve food at the bottom of the tank. We purposely put food at the bottom of the tank so that she has to work for it. Um, <clears throat> what? Um, by, the end of, by the end of this talk, you, I will give you a brief idea of a lot of these different things that you, will, that you would be able to understand. Um, species identification as well as a bit about their ecology and biology and some of the conservation issues that we have with sea turtles, not just here, but around the world. Um, so welcome to Sea Turtle 101. As I said before, uh, I'm going to give you a bit about sea turtle biology. Specifically, I'm just going to focus on a couple of things. Uh, how to identify a particular species, which seems to be a hot thing here in Singapore, as well as a bit about their life history. So how do they get from that to that? <clears throat> I also talk about uh, sea turtle ecology. Um, this is what I find more interesting stuff. Um, what's their function in the ecosystem? How important are they? And what are the implications for the entire marine system as a whole? As well as sea turtle conservation, what are the issues? And what's being done? And what's being done about um, some of these issues? Uh, then, how can I talk about sea turtles if I don't talk about what's hot in the news now, which is sea turtles in Singapore? So I will touch a bit about that <coughs> and some of the things that you would be able to do to help sea turtles. <coughs> okay, so I want to be very clear. I'm the sea turtle guy. I'm not a turtle guy. So if you send me a photo of a land turtle, if it's not a red ear slider, I'm not going to know what it is. <laughs> okay, I just want to be very clear on that because a lot of people say I'm a turtle man and they keep sending me pictures of like Chinese social turtles and I don't know what they are. <clears throat> um, most of my experience, uh, I'm currently an honor student in Murdoch University. I'm looking at flatback sea turtles. Um, simply put, I'm, u I'm firing lasers onto the beach to find decent real estate for sea turtles. Um, a lot of my work was in the Maldives where I worked with hawksbills and 
uh, green sea turtles, as well as Cassie, who is the one olive ridley turtle I had the chance to work with. And over there, I mostly worked on satellite tagging work, where because we have a captive rear release program, where we raise sea turtles to about a size where a lot of predators can't eat them, put a tag on them and let them go, and then uh, see where they go. And because at the time I was doing my nursing diploma, my uh, vet nursing diploma, I was the resident turtle nurse there as well. <coughs> so a bit about sea turtle biology. There are seven species of sea turtles, depending on who you talk to. Um, I am on the side, the much bigger side, that says there are seven species of sea turtles. Uh, there's a few people that say there are eight species of sea turtles. Um, just keep things simple, there are seven species of sea turtles. They all have about the same kind of biology. They all have the same kind of look, but as nature is, nature is very complicated, and there always are a few exceptions, which I'll point out later. Um, <clears throat> to start off, we got the top part of the sea turtle, we got the bottom part of the sea turtle. The top part of the shell is called the carapace. In a lot of indigenous cult cultures in Polynesia, where they did use to harvest turtles, like the full-grown turtles, they would actually use that as a shield. And uh, why they would use that as a shield, you'll get to see later, um, late, m much later in the presentation. The bottom part is the plastron, um, <coughs> and it has its own kind of nomenclature as well. So the top part of the carapace is what we normally use to identify sea turtles. There's only seven species. It's not that hard to identify. So I'll give you what I think is the easiest way to identify, the easiest parts of the sea turtle that you can use to try to determine what species you're looking at. So we have the nuchal, we have the nuchal, the scales, oh, I turned it off. No, no. So, so what do I press? That's it? Oh, the red button. Okay, so it's not turning off right okay. I'm technologically inept. <laughs> so this top, the scales that you see on the carapace and on the plaster on are called scoots. The very top scoot that you see here is called the nuchal scoot. And then you have the vertebral scoot. It makes sense. These are the scoots that are on the actual vertebrae of the sea turtle. The amount of scoots, the amount of scoots that you see there is the number of vertebral bones that the sea turtle has. On the sides, you have the costal scoots. These are what we use to identify sea turtles. The number usually is the number of scoots on the costal scoots that will help us figure out what species it is, along with a lot of other different things. And then you also have the marginal scoots, which are just do not press the red button, which are along the sides of the carapace. And then finally, you have the supracaudal scoot, which is just the fancy name for the piece of scoot above its tail. Looking at the plastron, uh, they have a bit of a different nomenclature. You got intergular, bigular muscles, and then everything else kind of makes sense as well. You have the humeral muscles, which is the humor over here. You have the pectoral muscles, the abdominal muscles, the femoral scoot, as well as the anal scoot. I don't have to explain that, okay? So, and then between the, the, between the costal scoots and these core scoots, you'll have the inframarginal scoots. And for those of you that want to take photos, you can take this one. And uh, also because it's very pretty, I quite like it. Let's take pictures. can, you can't carry it recording it for you, so. <laughs> Sorry, Uncle Carrie. <laughs> so see So these are just um, using the carapace and the plaster on is some of the ways that we use to identify uh, sea turtles. Um, but there's someone else that just came in that's pretty good at sea turtles as well. Um, the other things that we use to identify sea turtles are the scoots on the head. In particular, I like to use the prefrontal scoots. These are, this is what I actually use to try to figure out which tribe the turtle comes from. Um, I also like to use the beak as well, and generally the shape of the head. Uh, just an interesting part is that this area along the side, along the, the, the side of the sea turtle, for green sea turtles, hawksbills, loggerheads, flatbacks, um, and the olive ridley turtles, and the ridley turtles, you can use the pattern on the side of the heads to identify individual sea turtles. Mm. So there's a colleague that just published a paper uh, from Malaysia, and she got recreational divers to help her take photos 
of sea turtles, and they found out what the population of sea turtles within a particular dive site is. Um, but of course, it's biased to where divers will go. If you have good dive sites, they'll only go there. If you have bad, bad dive sites, we don't know what turtles are there. Um, again, I'll go back to this one. The reason I want to go back to this one is so that you can have a good idea of how they're um, related to phylogenetically, which is basically your genetics. I've been asked to not be too technical. Um, they're broken up like this, so you have the absolute ancestor of them all, and then it breaks out into these seven species of sea turtles. Before, there were, the fossil record indicates that there were probably tens of thousands of sea turtles at about the Cretaceous period, so around about the time the dinosaurs were alive, but now their legacy is alive by just seven species of sea turtles. So there are three tribes of sea turtles, which is a kind of te the technical term that we use to organize sea turtles. Um, the first tribe is the Keratini, and these guys are, the diagnostic feature of these guys is that they have two pre-orbital, two pairs of pre-orbital scoots. You also have the Keloninae, which is distinguishable with the single pair of pre-orbital scoots. And then you have the only living relative of this family, of this tribe, I couldn't find the tribe of it, but it's of this family, the Dermocalidae, uh, which is the leatherback sea turtles. So the leatherback sea turtles are probably representative of what ancient sea turtles used to look like. Um, as you can see, they don't have scoots at all. They just have like this leathery shell and ridges on it. So this is probably the number one diagnostic feature of a leatherback sea turtle. So if you see something coming up to the surface and it's got like ridges, that's probably it. Um, it's also got a face that would make one direction go the other direction. <laughs> um, but, what, but what they use this for is really just to eat a lot of jellyfish. They're really good jellyfish controllers in temperate waters. Um, and they are so big that they actually generate their own heat, which is not something that you see in reptiles, because reptiles need the sun to warm themselves up. They, they're so big and they move around so much that they just make their own heat. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing about these sea turtles is that they are huge. So if you're in Turanganu, if you're in Suriname, if you're in Costa Rica or Puerto Rico, and you see this massive black turtle on the beach and you think it's a dinosaur, it's probably this guy. <laughs> but they do look very dinosaur-like. Um, the next trout I'm going to fall go into is the Kelonanai. And these are your green sea turtles. Um, green sea turtles have four vertebral, four costal scoots on the side here. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And they have a really gentle looking face. Their beak is not very pronounced, it's very small, but it's still a bit keratinized. Um, they are relative, the flatback sea turtle, as true to its name, is really very flat. Um, I remember seeing these the first time and that was the first thing that ever occurred to me. They're very flat. You can't find these anywhere else except Australia. And that's really unheard of with sea turtle species because usually they have that oceanic, flat, uh, oceanic phase where they kind of wander around in the ocean. So I'll get into why, I'll get into why you can only find them in Australia. And they also have four scoots four costal scoots on the side here. So the way, obviously the way that you would distinguish them is between a green sea turtle and a flatback sea turtle. Flatbacks are really very flat. Green sea turtles have this nice kind of dome on them. So that's that's how you would distinguish them. Too. Also, um, flatback turtles, their heads are also a bit flatter and longer. Don't know why. Um, now I'm moving on to the keratinai. A uh, tribe of sea turtles, and the first one in here is the hospital sea turtle. These guys are hot in the news. Every time you see, every time you see a newspaper clicking, a clipping in Singapore of sea turtles, it's usually these guys, um, which makes sense because they're not fussy nesters. They don't mind really coarse grain. They don't. They nest in vegetation. They nest in the crappiest of places. So they're quite happy with our beaches, I suppose. Um, they also have four fossil scoots on the side. The most distinguishing feature about these guys is that their scoots overlap each other, uh, which is true to their scientific name, Embrocalis imbricata. Imbricata meaning imbricate, which means to, what's the word I just used? Overlap, like uh, roof shingles. 
And they do have this very pronounced beak as well, hence why they're called hawksbill turtles. Um, and true to the Keratini tribe, they have two pairs of pre-orbital scoots. Loggerhead sea turtles don't look very, they are actually very different from hawksbill turtles, but a lot of people have a tendency to try to have, have a tendency to mix them up. The easiest way is you just count the scoots. They actually have five costal scoots as opposed to four uh, that the hawksbill turtles have. And their beaks are huge, and their heads are actually really massive. That's why they're called loggerhead sea turtles. So if you compare a silhouette of a uh, hawksbill sea turtle to a loggerhead sea turtle, you can see that the head, in proportion to the rest of the body, is actually really massive. And they use that because they're mainly crustaceans. Their jaws are meant to crunch down and break all sorts of clams and sea turtle and, and not sea turtle shells, crab shells and etc. As I will demonstrate in this video. This video has gone around on Facebook. If it was me, you'd hear a little <laughs> 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 it's a tickle officer out of my hands. A uh, crayfish, yeah. And he's coming back for more. <laughs> Do not feed sea turtles. Do not feed sea turtles. Um, in the Maldives, we had the captive re release turtles, and we used to have two hawksbill turtles. And um, this is marine biologist behaving very badly, so kids, please don't do this. <laughs> we used to play chicken with the hawksbill sea turtle, so we put the finger in front of our hawksbill and see who would pull out the, the, the slowest. So the winner won a trip to the doctor's office and two stitches. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> um, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. So Kemp's Ridley, I'm going to go into the olive, into the Ridley sea turtles. They're two different species. Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, their shells are very, very round. So if you see something that also has uh, two preorbital, two pairs of preorbital scoops as well as five costal scoops on the side, or four, one, two, three, four, five, five. If you see something with five costal scoops and that, you just look at the size. They're really, and the shape, they're really very round, and they're really small. They're one of the smallest sea turtles that, uh, that are in the world. And uh, very likely, you're not gonna see this here. These guys are endemic to the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, so you're not gonna see them around here. Uh, there was a big project with these guys in, uh, te in Texas, so I'll get into that later. Um, they also have that same beak, that structure and these guys are mainly carnivores so they're a bit more selective with what they eat they don't they even don't like gelatinous food so they're not really fussed about eating um, jellyfish and that kind of stuff uh, olive ridley sea turtles is what Cassie is so the Cassie was olive ridley sea turtles they look exactly like Kemp's ridley sea turtles except their scoop patterns the costal scoop patterns are always asymmetric. They are. They do not mirror each other. You can get up to nine on one side and maybe like six on the other side. Normally you'll see about five to six. These are the only sea turtles in the world that have that kind of pattern and we don't know why. And if you compare it to the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, you can see that this is very nice and symmetrical and it's a lovely thing and then evolution spits this guy out and <laughs> it kind of makes you go, why? <laughs> um, Ridley, as I mentioned before, Ridley turtles do something called the Aribana, and they will congregate. When it's time for them to all kind of come and nest, they will all congregate just right at the shore, and if you fly a plane or a drone, they will just, you will see them littered all over the place. So each one of these dots is an olive Ridley sea turtle. Wow. And then once, once they've all congregated, they will nest that night like this. And they come in the thousands, like hundreds and thousands of them. So the olive really sea turtles do this in Costa Rica, uh, India, and in the Bay of Bengal. And the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles do this in two places in the United States. Uh, Texas, I can't remember in Texas, and in Florida. Uh, you do get olive really <coughs> sea turtles that just nest on their own. They don't really care. Uh, but when they do do the Aribada, it's in those particular locations and it's always in, it's just phenomenal. And the funny thing is, is that because they'll come out 
onto the beach to breed a few different, uh, few, a few times during the nesting season. After they've done an Aribata session, they'll go back into the water, they'll disperse for about two weeks, you don't see them. And in a single, and in a single day, you'll see them all congregate here like that. And then, the ne and then that night, they'll come back out to nest again. So it's, there's something about the environmental cues that switches them on and then they all go in and we're still trying to figure out why. You can also use the silhouette of the sea turtles to figure out what species it is. Uh, so if you're scuba diving and then your dive master tells you to look up, you can look up and if you see a turtle eclipse of the sun, you can use this to figure out what sea turtle it is. <laughs> um, so I'll test y'all. Uh, this was a sea turtle that was caught in a fisherman's net by accident. Um, so by the time they pulled it out, it was already dead. Um, I'll give you a hint to what it is. It was found in Malaysia. So it's not going to be the Kemp's Ridley or flatback turtle, because Kemp's Ridley is you only find them in the Atlantic, and the flatback you only find them in Australia. So anyone want to take a guess what that is? Oxbill. Oxbill? Mm, I can see why you think so, because of the B, but it's not. Also, uh, Loggerhead, no, because this one, its head is not huge. When you see a loggerhead, your first reaction is, holy, it's huge, the head. <coughs> olive Ridley? Olive Ridley, who said that? Well done, yes, it's an Olive Ridley. Um, it is an Olive Ridley. Uh, when it was sent to the WhatsApp group, there was a big argument as to whether it was a hawksbill or a loggerhead, but I was very certain it was an Olive Ridley. So I felt very vindicated when they confirmed the when they confirmed the species. Yes, and also because I know my biology well. Okay, um, this is very unique. They, um, the people that told us about this, said that they don't normally see all of Ridley's on that side of Malaysia, on the western side of Malaysia. But there's some research to indicate that they should be there. So I'll get into that in a bit. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is their. Come on in, am I? It's almost eight already. Oops. Okay. We started late. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about a bit about their life history because this seems to be a very popular thing to talk about. Um, all sea turtles start off as a little nest of eggs, depending on which species, between 50 to 120. And then after that, they will come out of their nests and then they'll scramble out into the water in a mad frenzy to try to get to the water as fast as they can and not get eaten. Um, after that, they'll end up in the open ocean and they'll find some kind of raft out there and they'll just chill out for the next few years. Um, it's always, the common belief is that they've always passively drift around, but we now know, if you said that maybe 10 or 20 years ago, that would have been the common knowledge, but nowadays there's new research that indicate that is not the case. Um, once they get too big for that raft to support them in terms of their nutrition, they will recruit, which means come back into the shallow area. So this is when you start to see some of the coral, see them in the coral, so the green, green, the, the green sea turtles, the hawksbill sea turtles, the loggerheads, and etc. Some sea turtles will forever stay in the ocean. So the, log so the leatherback sea turtles will always stay in the ocean. And because they're so big, you can find them up in temperate waters, where they will always chow down on jellyfish. Uh, Eastern, specific, Eastern Pacific olive ridley sea turtles also tend to be oceanic, whereas those in the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, they will recruit back into the, into the neurotic habitats. Once they've eaten a lot and they have enough energy stores, they will start spending Valentine's Day a little early, a little late, whichever one. But they will, before that, they will make those migrations back to where they came out of their nest from. So this is called natal homing. And, we, and there's very good evidence to indicate that they use the Earth's magnetic field to figure out the general country that they're meant to be in. But then after that, how they select the beach, how they select the nesting site is all very still in, still unknown. And part of my research is figuring out how do they pick out a specific nesting site. Um, after that, they will nest. That's a terrible photo of this projector. <laughs> the, the, if you can see the vague shape of a sea turtle head. 
with the shell and the fins. <laughs> it's there. You have to, I can see it here. You have to believe me. Okay, it's there. Um, we use red lights over in Western Australia because they can't see red. Uh, I know in some places they use white lights here as well as here in uh, Singapore. Uh, someone asked me that question. I'll get back to you about it. Okay, so incubation is a very sensitive t time for sea turtles. Um, usually after two hours, uh, two hour, usually when they want to move the eggs to a hatchery, you have to do it within two hours of being laid, because once these guys hit oxygen, they start development. So after two hours, there's a thin membrane that develops at the top of the shell, and if you move it, so if you tilt it, pitch, roll, yaw, anything, that membrane breaks, and it falls into the yolk, and the embryo basically dies. So after two hours, if you want to move it to a hatchery, you have to wait for about maybe 30 or 40 days. Um, they, also display, they also display this thing called temperature dependent sex determination, TSD, where the temperature of the incubation area will determine what gender the sea turtle is. Um, the first time I heard this was in the Jawara Turtle Project, and the guy said, cool guys and hot chicks. <laughs> I only found out this was kid friendly, so this was some NC-16 stuff that I had to take it out. I'm a bit disappointed about that. Um, anything below that temperature and anything above those temperatures are fatal. You'll get eggs that cook. So um, this has implications for climate change. After that, they will hatch. What usually happens with sea turtles when they hatch is that first they'll pipe out through their egg, they'll crawl out, and they still have the egg yolk attached to them. So they'll spend a few days inside the nest just absorbing the egg yolk. And once they have completed, once they have absorbed the egg yolk, they'll start get, trying to get themselves out. And there was a paper done, I think in the 70s, where they actually watched the sea turtles in a cross section climbing out, and, they, and it indicates that the whole nest actually works together. So you get the top layer of turtles that actually dig the sand and push the sand down you get the middle turtles that will push the sand down more, and you get the bottom turtles that will pad the sand down so that they can try to rise up. Uh, the other thing is that the bottom sea turtles also have another important role, which is basically a cheerleader. So when the top and the middle guys get really tired and the whole nest just stops, the bottom ones just shake. Have you ever seen a beehive when one thing shakes and everyone shakes? Sea turtles do that as well, so the bottom ones will shake and then the whole thing just wakes up and they start digging again. So it's that very kind of swarm mentality. And then after probably a day or two of digging, they are absolutely tired and they will stick their head out into the sun. And this is the most dangerous part. Um, because that guy is basically the sacrificial lamb, pops his head out, what's there? <laughs> and whatever's there, that's going to be the last thing it sees, the first and last thing it sees. And then one, and this is what we call the boil. And it's not, they're not boiling, but it's called a boil because it looks like they're boiling. But, and after this, they have the gauntlet of getting from the nest to the water. And on the way, you get things like ghost crabs. I absolutely hate ghost crabs. Have you ever seen ghost crabs at East Coast Park? They're massive, and they're the most hideous things. And, but once, they, once, once they've gone through the ghost crab minefield, they will also go through the coral reef, which has all sorts of things that will eat them. Um, there's an indication that high tide tends to be, high tide allow, has a better chance for sea turtle survival than low tide. I think it's because when the tide's low, they're closer to the coral, and the grouper don't have, and the big fish don't have to go so far to grab them. Mm. But even once they get to open ocean, you got things like open ocean sharks and big things that will also keep an eye out for them and want to munch on something that's pretty bite-sized in a shark's perspective. Mm. Um, however, once they do get out there and they do find a bit of raft, they will chill out. So in the Indian Ocean and within the Atlantic Ocean, there's, there are these rafts called the Sargassum Rafts. And within these rafts, these are ecosystem communities in amongst themselves. So they have like producers, and they have plants growing, and they've got shrimp and everything. So this is perfect for a sea turtle about that size to go in and eat whatever small things are there. And as I mentioned before, there was all the prior to this, the accepted the accepted knowledge was that they always tended to drift very passively with the current. It was always thought that they were too small to try to fight against the current. But there are some very intelligent people over at um, 
the US um, on the Atlantic Ocean side that showed these are captured bird release turtles. So they were released after a year when they're big enough to have a satellite tag be put on them. And there's very good indication that they stay, that they actively swim in waters that are warm. They don't like cold water. Mm. So when the current, so, and that makes sense because a lot of the currents, the, the current actually forks at about here, where you either go up into the UK or you go back down towards Africa and you come back up towards the Gulf of Mexico. And that makes sense because if the current split, you would see more turtles in the UK. But you don't. You don't see a lot of cold drop <coughs> turtles over there. Um, there's also an indication that there are different types of strategies. So what we have here is a green sea turtle, but it's not very green. It's actually black and white. And this is very important in the marine environment because that's called countershading. So the white part is white so that if there are predators underneath it, it they can't see the sea turtle with the, uh, with the lights. But the top part is black, so if there's a predator above it, the predator can't see it when it's being camouflaged with the abyss. But, which means that they spend a lot of time outside of Sargass and Morass, but within a month, they start getting a bit of color, which blends very well with whatever Sargass and Morass they might have out there. So there's an indication that there are different strategies to how a sea turtle is, will try to survive out there. But then you throw a wrench into the whole thing and you get a flatback turtle. Now, flatback turtles are actually huge. Their hatchlings are like this. They look like the giant cookies that you want to eat in the Christmas store. And they, they look like chocolate chip cookies, like for real. And they're massive. They are huge. And their coloration is not what we would expect of something to be very well camouflaged with um, Sargassum Ras. And there's very, very good evidence that they don't actually have that oceanic phase, that they stay within the near shore environments where the water is quite murky. And this is why you only find them in Australia, because they nest in Australia, they hatch from Australia, and they just chill out in Australia. And they're like Australians do. And they're big, <laughs> so a lot of predators that would normally eat small hatchlings like that size wouldn't be able to eat them. Oops. Okay, so I skipped a bit, but that's fine. So now we get to the neuritic stage, where they go into the coastal habitats. Um, you'll see a lot of these hawksbills, the loggerhead sea turtles, the green sea turtles, some olive ridley sea turtles. Um, you will never see, you will never ever ever see, I guarantee you, a leatherback sea turtle in the neuritic habitats. So I would have thought five years ago. <laughs> because now there's evidence that they do come to the near shore environments, but they still eat the same things. Jellyfish. So if there's a lot of jellyfish in the near shore environments, they will eat there. People don't know if this is normal or not, because with the warming temperatures, are jellyfish actually moving into the near shore environments, and is that why we're seeing more leatherbacks? This might be a problem that we don't actually want. Um, once they've gotten fat, they will make their breeding migrations back to where they nested from. So I don't have really, the only way I can really display this is with maps. Um, so there are turtles that were tagged here nursing, that they were nesting, and they swim all this way back to the foraging grounds here. These flatback turtles here were nested here in what we call the Dampier Range, and then they all decided to go back to where they were foraging at. And where they forage is usually where the currents carry them. So the currents carry them and they settle in habitats over there, they will forage there, and they will make the migrations back. Same thing here, we have olive Ridley turtles that nest here, but they chill out on this side of the Gulf of Mexico. And you get olive, and you get Kemp's Ridley's here, that, uh, sorry, these are loggerheads. And you get loggerheads that nest here, and they'll go elsewhere, probably to the other side of the ocean. Maybe not even to the other side of the ocean, maybe just the, up north a little bit. But they do make these vast interoceanic um, migrations just to get back to their breeding grounds. And then after that, you get nesting sea turtles. So nesting, so it's only the females that ever come up onto land. You will never see the males on land, except in Hawaii. Because in Hawaii, the males actually come out of the water to bask and warm themselves up, which is unheard of. The green turtles there are also much darker, which is why you have some people say that they're a completely different species. That's the black sea turtle. The genetics indicates that the 
that the genetics is not different enough for them to be a separate species, but the shape, their color, their size, their behavior is all different, which is why a lot of people say that it is a different species, but I say it's not enough. Not just me, a lot of other people. So, so when they come out, when they come out to nest, they have a lot of other issues as well. Um, there are raccoons over at the United States that will eat the eggs as the turtles are nesting. So they they will just reach down and grab an egg in the middle of it. So there goes a hundred eggs that never made it to see light. So yeah, that's turtles don't get it easy. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get into sea turtle ecology, which is what I actually think is way more interesting than a lot of the biological stuff. This is what I'm interested in because there's a lot of statistics in that and I'm a bit of a nerd. So um, when we're looking at this life history, you notice, you can see that they travel a lot. They go to a lot of different places and there are different strategies for them to survive, to try to avoid predators and to try, and to, try to basically just stay alive. And then once they get big enough, there's actually very few things that they have to worry about eating them. So then that strategy changes. So throughout their entire life, they're using different strategies in different environments, they're eating different things. And because they make that, that migration, they bring nutrients from one side of the ocean to the other. So that has a lot of implications for the ecology of not just sea turtles, but of the entire marine environment. Well, I'll start off with sea turtles as prey. So when they're incubating, you get a lot of things that would like to eat them, like this ghost crab, which was seen at, I think this is Pasir Reis. I think it's Pasir Reis. Um, ghost crabs will dig into the nest, and then they will eat the eggs. If you get a big ghost crab, they will just guard that entire nest, and they'll eat maybe like four throughout the entire incubation period. But if it's in Brazil, where the fishermen grab the big ghost crabs because they're easier to catch, you get all the small ones that say, ooh, no one's guarding the eggs. So you get like 10 ghost crabs in a single nest, and that whole nest is decimated. So keeping ghost crabs might seem a bit counterintuitive, but in order to make sure that the small crabs don't get a chance to totally decimate the eggs, you've got to keep them. Um, these guys, as in Australia, they call them goannas. Over here, we call them monitor lizards. Um, they, can, they have a really good sense of smell, especially for freshly nested eggs. Uh, like what one of the volunteers found out when he was out doing his thing in one of the southern islands, this was in the paper. Um, he noticed a monitor lizard digging at a nest and eating the turtles, turtle eggs. So then he scared her off, and there it was there was egg yolk everywhere. So um, they called us in, and then we just covered back up. And uh, plants also predate on turtle nests. Like their roots will get into the nest and they will grow and they will penetrate eggshells. And because the eggshells are full of yolk and fats and lipids, they just suck that up and they grow so quickly. So that's, that's in the incubation period, that's what they're prey to. When it gets to um, their emergence, they have a lot of issues, as I mentioned before, with ghost crabs. But, oh, there it is. And um, it's not just ghost crabs, they also have to worry about birds that come around as well, um, that will pick them off. Some people think that the Aribadas are actually, is actually an evolutionary trait to try to fight this. So what happens is that when you have a lot of sea turtle hatchlings coming out, you get something called predator saturation. That at one point in time, there is so much prey that the predators can't eat all of them at once. So they'll eat and they'll get stuffed and they'll see turtles going down like, oh, I can't move. So then they just let the rest of them go. So the ones that basically get eaten are the sacrificial lambs for the good of the entire population. So that's probably why one reason and the Aribadas occurs, but there's a lot of other different reasons as to why they might. Um, then we get into, then we get into the, the oceanic habitat. Who's watched Blue Planet 2? Yeah, so you guys would know what this scene is. This was in the recent one. So this isn't, so when they're out in the ocean, they also have to worry about oceanic sharks. And because they're young, they don't know how to use their shells yet. So you will see later how a sea turtle uses its shell to defend against a shark. But this sea turtle, you can see it's very young, probably its first time encountering a shark and thought, oh, it's a new friend. <laughs> and then when the sea turtle, when the shark decides to come and give it a kiss, ah, that's not a friend. So this, that sea turtle is actually really lucky. Um, 
if it was a green sea turtle, if it was a green sea turtle, that fin would have been ripped right off. Hawksbill sea turtles, I think their flesh is poisonous. I think. Um, at least the adults, I don't know about the juveniles, not that I've tried. I haven't. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's one. That's one. And uh, when they become adults, it doesn't stop there. They have to, even though they're really big, they have to worry about tiger sharks and bull sharks. These are only things that will try and get them. So this sea turtle, this is not his first shark that he's encountered. So he knows that the way to, is it he or she? It might be a she. It's a, it's a female. So she, see how she turns her shell, her carapace towards the shark. Right. So you can't get his mouth. Right. So the sharks can't actually. This particular shark. The only reason they can eat sea turtles is because if it catches them at the side, its mouth is wide enough to grab them because they're quite flat. But if a sea turtle turns its side to it, it can't get its jaws around the carapace. So these, are, but it's not always successful. Sea turtles will sometimes get eaten. There are. There are some pictures and videos out there of sea turtles having chunks of their carapace missing, and obviously they're dead when they're washed up. Um, sea turtles don't get a break. When they come onto the land, they're also predated on. Um, this was taken by a colleague in Australia. So he was very brave. He sat there with crocodile infested waters and turtles on the beach. So what the crocodiles usually do, they'll just am they're usually ambush predators, so they'll just wait for the turtles to come back, intercept them, and eat them. But he did witness this one thing that he wrote in the paper. On one occasion, a large crocodile, estimated to be more than 4.5 meters in length, crawled up the ascending olive ridley track with its belly dragging on the sand until approximately 10 meters away from the nesting turtle. The track marks of the crocodile indicate that it lifted its body off the sand and ran the remaining distance to the nesting turtle where the attack occurred rather than using common gaits such as high walking or galloping. The severe force of the impact was indicated by a piece of carapace that was flung 20 meters away after impact. Over three meters from the point of impact, oh there it is. The track marks indicate that the turtle broke free at one stage with a bit of its carapace missing, but was recaptured five meters closer to the water and then carried above ground. So this was, um, so turtles don't get a break. <laughs> They're predated in every part of their life of their life stage. But now we're going to turn the tables onto sea turtles as predators. Now I use the word predator in an ecological sense. Predator in ecology means an organism taking part or the entire piece of another organism. So plants are also organisms. So it's not such an it's not such an epic imagery of the gazelle stalked the plant on the spread. It's not as it's not as epic, but as as a gazelle being chased by a cheetah. But it's the same thing. So you get so you get different um, niches for different sea turtles. So you get hawksbill sea turtles that will eat sponges. They're primarily known as spongivores. You get loggerhead sea turtles that will eat a lot of crustaceans. So they're crustaceivores, and then. Green sea turtles are the only species of sea turtle that convert from an omnivorous environment uh, diet, which means they eat plants and animals, to a completely plant-based diet. And all they eat is seagrass. Oh. And seagrass environments, and seagrass environments are actually really, really important for green sea turtles. But there's a catch. Off the coast of Caribbean, the sea turtles have actually learned to dig into the sand and rip out the little roots of the sea of the seagrass. So usually other places, the sea turtles just kind of nip the bud of, this, of the seagrass and it allows the grass to grow. These sea turtles dig, they rip out the roots so the seagrass can't grow back. So this particular marine protected area has an issue of too many green sea turtles. Hmm. And when they have too many green sea turtles that are doing that, the whole seagrass community is dead. And now you don't have a seagrass community to be a nursery for the fish. So this is why when you want to think about conserving sea turtles, you need to think of an ecosystem method rather than just a single species method. Um, leatherback sea turtles are gelat. They eat jellyfish. This is all that they eat. So there are some people off of Nova Scotia, Canada, that put a camera on a few, on I think about 132 leatherback sea turtles. And these sea turtles eat in a single dive, like in about two hours, they eat about 664 jellyfish. 
And I think, I think the, the manuscript said the time of handling was uh, correlated to the size of the jellyfish. So the bigger the jellyfish, the longer it took for the, for the sea turtle to handle it. But they eat up to about, in a single dive, about 330 kilograms wet weight of jellyfish, which is absolutely phenomenal. So if you think that you don't have jet leatherback sea turtles in the water anymore, you got 664 more jellyfish that are coming over to East Coast Park. <laughs> so these guys are really, really important. Um, so what does all this mean? This is where I, this is where I start to get really nerdy, and this is where I really like the ecosystem kind of perspective of sea turtles. Um, even though green sea turtles actually can be detrimental in high numbers to seagrass meadows, what they actually do is that when they eat the seagrass and it goes through their digestive system, it comes out richer in nutrients. So the sea turtle only actually absorbs only about 34% of the nutrients from the seagrass from the seagrass. And because the digestional tract has a lot of bacteria in it, the bacteria add to that seagrass nutritional value. And it comes out with more amino acids. And amino acids is what you use to create more proteins. Because that the seagrass now is in a is richer and is in a form that's easily accessible to bacteria, to little shrimp that will break it down, the shrimp is able to break it down and those nutrients get returned into the seagrass meadows and then the seagrass is able to grow more. And that also adds more nutrients into the water column for other things like plankton. So if you get a lot of plankton, then a lot of fish can come and they can eat the plankton, which is perfect because seagrass meadows are actually nurseries for a lot of fish. So that's how important green sea turtles are. Mm. These guys kind of do the same thing. So you get the olive ridleys, the kemp's ridleys, and the loggerheads, which are crustaceophores. They will take an entire crab so, okay, imagine, take this analogy, you take a log and you put a match to it. Is it going to light on fire? No, right? If you break it up into small twigs and you light each one of those up, will they light on fire? They will. So if you take a crab and you want to try to decompose it, it's not going to take, it's going to take a long time. These guys quicken that rate. So they break it down into small pieces so that a lot of other fish have access to all that meat and the nutritional value is now returned back into the ecosystem. These guys, of course, they prevent jellyfish from coming and stinging your legs and your kids. And even when we're looking at the nest of sea turtles, um, okay, so what, what, this graph, what this graph is showing is basically the amount of uh, those nutrients that are returning to different parts of the beach. So if you look at this, you only get about a third to about a fourth to about 40% of nutrients returning to the ocean in the form of hatchlings. So these are the hatchlings that survive, but some of them are returned to land predators. <clears throat> so what I mentioned before, that the roots will grow into the sea turtle eggs, they will absorb marine nutrients, mm -hmm. and they will flower. And then you get the bees that will come, and they will absorb, and they will take the nectar with marine nutrients. You also get predators that will come, they'll take the nest, they'll take the eggs, they'll eat until they're full, and think, oh my god, I've got to store this. They'll put it elsewhere inland. When they put it elsewhere inland, they cache it. They want to eat it for later, but they're stupid. They forget where it is. So that thing decomposes further inland, further than it would have if it was just here. So you get a lot of plants now that have a lot of marine nutrients in them because of turtle eggs. So if you have a lot of turtle eggs in a certain area, you're going to have really good uh, flora biodiversity within that area. And if you have a lot of flora